Welcome back, everyone. This is going to be our final part for Chapter 3. Um, as a reminder, the chapter is entitled Self, the Living Units. Quite a few discussions about the cell in Part 1 and Part 2. Um, so now it's kind of time to wrap it up and take a look at our last few topics, which will be the cell cycle, transcription, and translation. All right. So the cell cycle is basically a series of events or phases that each cell will go through as it grows, functions, and eventually starts to reproduce. When you look at the cell cycle, we basically have two major events to discuss. The first one is called interphase, and this is when the cell is doing its day-to-day -day activities. It is subdivided by G1, S, and G2. And as you can see on the notes, I wrote down by S phase that this is where you have DNA synthesis. And the goal of the S phase is to double the DNA that the cell starts off with. And the reason we're doubling the DNA is because the second major period of the cell cycle is all about cell division. So getting the cell to produce new daughter cells, a new generation of cells. Now for our discussion, we're going to concentrate on mitosis. And mitosis is a form of cell division that will allow us to go from one to two daughter cells. And these daughter cells will be identical to the parental cells, meaning that they will have the same amount of chromosomes or the same amount of DNA that the parental cell started off with. In case you were wondering, the other version of cell division is meiosis. Meiosis is when you have a cell that will divide into four creating daughter cells that have half the genetic information that the parental strand had. This is usually seen in gametes or our reproductive cells, where we produce for us sperm and eggs that will only have 23 chromosomes. And that is because, of course, when it's time for you to produce the next generation, the paternal contribution will be 23 chromosomes through the sperm. The maternal, chromo uh, the maternal contribution for the chromosome will be 23 to the oocyte, producing a zygote or a fertilized egg that has 23 plus 23 is 46 chromosomes. All of the other cells in your body, so besides the sex cells, all of the other cells in your body will utilize mitosis as a form of cell reproduction. And that of course means that you go from one cell to two daughter cells that are identical in genetic material. So you go from one cell with 46 to two cells with 46 chromosomes in each as their daughter cells. In order to do that, it would make sense that at one point or another, we have to double our DNA. And as I was mentioning before, that's gonna happen during the S subphase of interphase. Interphase is the longest part of the cell cycle because once again, that is when the cell is doing its day-to-day -day activity starting with G1, where you have a brand new cell that will start to grow and start doing transcription and translation and function as that cell is meant to function. Then it will go ahead and do the S phase, double its DNA, going from 46 to 92. And after that is done, it does have a G2 subclass to worry about. And that's just making sure that everything is ready for cell division that there is no mutations, that all the proteins are working properly, so that the cell can smoothly go into the second phase of the cell cycle, which is cell replication. And in this case, we're going to talk about meiosis, my apologies, mitosis. And in order to do mitosis, we have some other subclasses in there. So you can see from the image, we're going to be talking about prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. Now, I like to remember the sentence, I passed my anatomy test. I passed my anatomy test. And if you remember that sentence, you wanna remind yourself that the first letter of each word will help you with the phases of the cell cycle in order. So interphase, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. I passed my anatomy test. And keep in mind that interphase is day-to-day -day activity and that mitosis will start with prophase. So prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, those are the stages of mitosis. And if you add interphase to it, those are all the stages of the cell cycle. 
We're going to spend a little bit more time talking about the individual events that happen during mitosis, but I want to talk more about DNA replication right now because I think to understand the process that goes into going from 46 to 92 chromosomes. Now, first off, DNA replication is what we call a semi-conservative replication. And what that means is that when you go from one strand to two strands, the two daughter strands are going to be half old and half new. So here's a very rough drawing of me. I'm gonna make a little ladder. That's gonna represent my original DNA strand. And what happens in DNA replication is that the DNA will unzip and remember the little rungs of the ladders, those are your A, your T, your G's and your C's. So the DNA will unzip itself so that you can expose the sequence of letters. And we're gonna do our law of complementary base pairing. So anytime you have an A for adenine, it's going to get hydrogen bonded to a T for thymine and guanine and cytosine are gonna be bonded together. In order to do that, we're gonna rely on an enzyme called the DNA polymerase. And that DNA polymerase will attach itself to the parental strand, and it will come up with the complementary base pairing. And as it's base pairing, it's restoring the double helix function of the DNA, and it's also producing two copies instead of one. And at the end of the two copies, you can see that each DNA strand will be half red for old and half purple for the newly generated part. So that is then semi-conservative half old and half new. There are a handful of enzymes that are needed to make this successful. I had mentioned to you the DNA polymerase, that is the primary one that is able to attach itself through the strand of DNA, the original strand, and come up with complementary nucleotides as it's forming the newly synthesized one on the daughter DNA. Some other enzymes I would like to discuss with you have been listed at the bottom of our slide. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go over to the illustration on the next part and see how the helicase, binding proteins, and the ligase come into play. And of course, we're gonna highlight our DNA polymerase, who really does most of the work, right? So here, here is an illustration where we have our chromosomes, and as they start uncoiling, we see that we have our naked DNA appearing with the backbone, and the nucleides, nucleotides holding it together. Notice the color coding. And the first thing we need to do is we need to go ahead and we need to unzip the DNA. We need to open it up. Now, the enzyme that's going to unzip that DNA, that is called the helicase enzyme. So the helicase enzyme will unzip it, almost like a zipper, allowing for both ends to separate. Now, when you do that, the DNA has a tendency to want to coil back up. So what we see is that we have these uh, proteins called binding proteins that are often represented as little circular forms. They will adhere to the open strands to make sure that the DNA doesn't coil back up. So you have the helicase that will unzip, and then you have my little version drawn right here of the binding proteins that keep the DNA strand nice and open. Once it's ready to go, we see that our DNA polymerase utilizing a little primer that's being built for it, will go ahead and anchor onto the exposed DNA strand. And it will start moving into what we call a leading or a lagging strand. The leading strand means that the DNA polymerase will move in a forward pattern. And as it does so, it forms a smooth linear, or I should say a smooth continuous strand of old and new as it's forming the DNA strand. So leading strand, the DNA polymerase is moving forward and the DNA is fully intact that's being generated. That's important to note because the other DNA polymerase is gonna be moving as a lagging strand. And the lagging strand means that it's moving in a backwards pattern. And when it does that, instead of creating one smooth piece, it creates small little sections of newly synthesized DNA. So the lagging strand is when the DNA polymerase moves backwards and creates small little sequences or strands of DNA instead of a smooth part. Why is that so important to point out? Well, because we will need an additional enzyme 
to link these little pieces together. And that enzyme is called the ligase enzyme. The ligase enzyme will smooth together the smaller sections on the lagging strand. These smaller sections are called Akasaki fragments, and Akasaki fragments are created due to the DNA polymerase moving in a backwards fashion. So once again, whenever you have your DNA replication, you're going to need to utilize your helicase enzyme to unzip, your binding proteins to keep it open, your DNA polymerase will anchor on, and if it's moving in the leading strand, it's moving in a continuous forward motion, producing a solid strand of daughter, or I should say newly synthesized DNA, that's half old and half new. And the DNA polymerase that moves along the lagging strand or produces the lagging strand will produce sections or fragments of DNA called Akasaki fragments. And those fragments will be sealed together by the ligase enzyme. So the ligase enzyme is only active in the lagging strand because that is the only part that creates the fragment. The leading strand will just continue on and the DNA will be as a solid piece from beginning. At the end of doing DNA replication, you have gone from 46 to 92. So keep in mind that you still only have one cell, but that cell now has 92 chromosomes, which is too much for us. And the cell is doing this because what it now wants to do is it wants to physically separate the one cell into two daughter cells, and each daughter cell will receive 46 chromosomes. Now, how do we go from one to two cells? Well, that is where mitosis will come into play. Mitosis is gonna concentrate on physically separating the cells and creating two new daughter cells. Now, keep in mind that with mitosis, we need to have daughter cells that have the same number of chromosomes. So part of the mechanics will entail taking those 92 chromosomes, lining them up and separating them into two separate batches so that we can have two of 46. This is going to be get done in four different substages. You have your prophase, your metaphase, your anaphase, and your telophase. And I just realized I went from purple to red. Let me go back to my regular color. Now I wrote down some of the events or characteristics that will happen at the phase. And these are just sort of the highlights. There are other things that occur, but these are the ones that we need to know. So the first thing that's going to happen is prophase. Prophase is going to be all about getting access to the DNA. So we see that the cell will start getting rid of the nuclear membrane. It will start to get rid of its nucleus. In fact, under the microscope, it almost looks like the nucleus is slowly increasing in size and then fading away as the nuclear membrane breaks down. The DNA will start to coil up so it becomes more visible and more easily to move around. Then you enter metaphase. Metaphase is when we take our sister chromatids. Remember, tids, chromatids means that you have a duplicate copy. That's what we have because we just did DNA synthesis. Metaphase will align the sister chromatids, all 92 of them, and arrange them in the middle or the equator of the cell. Once they're in the middle, it's time to separate. So that's what anaphase is going to take care of. Anaphase will break, allow for the centromeres to break between the sister chromatids and allow them to move to opposite ends of the cell. So 46 chromosomes to the left, 46 chromosomes to the right. Once that separation has occurred, then in telophase, it is time to reform our nucleus because we are eukaryotic organisms. And once the nuclei have reformed, then we need to separate the whole cell. So that is where cytokinesis is going to come in. Cytokinesis happens at the tail end of telophase. It is not its own phase within the cell cycle, but cytokinesis is very important because it allows us to divide the cytoplasmic content, therefore creating two separate daughter cells that each have 46 chromosomes. And once these daughter cells are fully formed, they will continue on with the cell cycle and enter into interphase and proceed accordingly. 
Now, what is guiding the cells from one cycle to the next? Well, it's a group of proteins called cyclins. Cyclins will determine when a cell is ready to go from one phase to the next. And along the way, the cell will encounter checkpoints. And checkpoints are basically areas, as the name indicates, where the DNA and the proteins are checked to make sure that there's no mutations or mistakes. And if a mutation is detected, then the cell will go ahead and induce apoptosis or program cell death. The reason that you see P53 in parentheses is because that is a well-studied checkpoint um, system of the cell cycle. And in fact, scientists have determined that people with mutations in their P53 checkpoint are usually at an increased chance of developing cancer or any other abnormalities during their lifespan. So these checkpoints are extremely important because it's one of the ways that we can regulate viable DNA with no mutations in our system. Illustrated example of our mitotic stages. So as you can see, we're going to start off with interphase. And in interphase, you see that you have your membrane intact, the nucleus is fully formed, the DNA is floating around, and when it's time to go ahead and start with mitosis, then we see that in prophase, the main goal will be for the nuclear envelope to disappear. So notice on my last picture that the nucleus is completely gone, my chromosomes are tightly coiled up, and I'm able to see the sister chromatids as they emerge from the nucleus. And I love this picture right here, because here in blue, you can really see how the DNA starts to look like little pieces of thread. So those are your sister chromatids. So prophase is all about getting rid of the nucleus and being able to visualize the DNA. And then once you have that, and into metaphase, Metaphase is when you're going to be using your spindles, courtesy of your centrioles, to align the sister chromatids down the equator or middle of the cell. Once they're aligned, then it's time to separate. So anaphase will utilize the spindle to start moving the sister chromatids. So now what we see is that we're back in our chromatin format. One copy each. One goes to the left and one goes to the right. And last but not least, we need to restore. So you're going to notice in telophase that the chromosomes will start to bundle up again together as the nucleus starts to reform itself. Here you can see it says nuclear envelope is forming. And last but not least, these little dotted lines right in the middle of the cell, that is what we call cleavage furrow, which is the first two signs that the cytokinesis is about to occur, the splitting of the cytoplasm. So I passed my anatomy test. Interphase is day to day, and then when you go into mitosis, it is prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. Here is an illustration of the mitotic pathways in an aluminum or a plant cell. Um, I like to include these pictures because plants, due to their cell wall, have an easier time being uh, photographed. And I feel like they're a little bit more organized because it looks like a brick wall stacked together. So you can see in interphase, the nucleus is fully intact. In prophase, the nucleus starts to swell as the nuclear envelope is dissolving. And notice how the chromosome is becoming darker, and that's because it's condensing. Finally, in metaphase, we align it down the center of the cell. And then anaphase has the separation of the sister chromatids into two separate batches due to the guidance of the spindle. And last but not least, telophase will entail reforming the nucleus. And of course, we're gonna see cytokinesis occur. And you can see the line right here, indicating the starting of the division of the cytoplasm. I would like to point out that in plant cells, that little line is called the cell plate, not cleavage furrow. Cleavage furrow is for um, our cells, our animal cells. The cell plate is what we call it in plant cells because plants have a cell membrane and a cell wall that needs to be divided. Once we have our DNA replicated, it is now time to utilize it and get some access to what the cell is going to be doing in interface, right? It's day-to-day -day replication. So interface is going to involve high amounts of transcription and translation. 
written in the genomic strands of DNA. So now we're going to take a look at what that actually means. Well, as you may recall from part two, we talked about the fact that the DNA that's housed in your nucleus cannot leave the nucleus. And instead, whenever a particular section or a gene is required, it will make a copy of it in the form of RNA. That process of going from DNA to RNA, that is called transcription. And the RNA, once processed, can go ahead and leave the nucleus and interact freely within the cytoplasmic region. And the main goal is to go from RNA to a polypeptide or a protein strand. Once that's done, then what we've done is we've done translation. So transcription is when you go from DNA to RNA, and it happens in the nucleus because that's where your DNA is housed. And translation is when you take your RNA and you make a protein. And this happens within the cytoplasm of the cell. Here it is kind of drawn out. I'm sorry, a type dot, I should say. So the section of the DNA that we are interested in is called a gene. And we're going to go ahead and do transcription, which is to go from DNA to RNA. And then translation is when you do RNA to protein. Now, in a little bit, I'm going to show you some illustrations. And we're going to talk about the fact that once you make your copy of your DNA into RNA, the whole strand doesn't automatically migrate into the cytoplasmic region. There are different things that can be done to process and stabilize the RNA. One of the things that we see is this process called splicing. Splicing means that the DNA is cut up and certain sections are removed. These are called introns. Introns are discarded. And the sections of DNA that remain are called exons. And a quick way to remember which one you keep is just think of the exon, the EX, means it exits and it can be used to ex be expressed in a protein format. So the introns we get rid of and then the exons we keep. The um, enzyme we require to go from DNA to RNA is called the RNA polymerase. And in our eukaryotic cells, we rely on transcription factors, which are groups of proteins that will determine when a particular gene will turn on and off. Once we have our RNA, then it's time to do our translation, which is to produce our protein strand. And our conversations are going to be guided around the fact that there are different types of RNA. They're coming up on our next slide. And the RNA that carries the true message is mRNA, messenger RNA, which once we produce that will be read in codons, which are sequences of three nucleotides at a time to tell the cell which amino acid it needs to code for. AA stands for amino acid. When it comes to RNA, I definitely want to highlight a few differences. First off, the, um, the sugar backbone is different. RNA stands for ribose nucleic acid. Um, it is single-stranded, although it does have the ability to form a double bond. Um, RNA also will have a different nucleotide. It will have uracil, so keep that in mind. There is no thymine in RNA. It has been swapped out for uracil. Adenine, guanine, and cytosine will stay the same. Um, the RNA comes in three main types. We have our messenger RNA, which is a direct copy of the DNA that we're interested in. And like I said, we're going to read them in what we call codons, which are three nucleotide sequence at the time. So please keep in mind, anytime you see codon, I want you to think three letters, and it's mRNA. Now, the ribosomal RNA or the rRNA will work together with the ribosomes, hence the name, and it will be able to read the mRNA. It will be able to read the message and figure out which amino acids are required. These amino acids will be brought over by transfer RNA. And when the transfer RNA comes over to the complex, it wants to make sure to deposit the proteins correctly. So it's gonna utilize an anti-codon, which is complementary to the codon. When they match up, then we see that the amino acid is properly dropped off and it continues to collect itself in a polypeptide format until the protein is formed. In order
to do transcription, we're going to need to do three phases. These phases are going to be called initiation, elongation, and termination. In initiation, what we see happening is that the DNA strand is properly prepped for transcription to occur, and that will involve the unzipping of the DNA and the attachment of the RNA polymerase. Once the RNA polymerase is attached and is ready to go, we then go into elongation. And what we see happening here is this is where the bulk of the work is done. So the RNA polymerase will glide along the DNA and will establish complementary nucleotides. So if there is a G on the DNA strand, it will bring over a C. If there's a T on the DNA strand, it will bring over an A. If there's an A, it will bring over a U. That's correct because there's no T in RNA. So an elongation is really where all the hard work is being done and your DNA strand is being copied into RNA. Once the elongation hits um, a terminal signal, we then go into termination. And termination, as the name indicates, means that it's going to stop. So at this point, the RNA polymerase will fall off, the DNA will coil right back up, and you now have a brand new strand of RNA that is ready for processing. Her. Here we have a beautiful illustration of our DNA molecule. As you can see, we have our RNA polymerase ready to go. So with the help of transcription factors, it will go ahead and it will find the promoter or the starter section. It will anchor itself onto the DNA. And once the RNA polymerase is in stand, it will go ahead and start sliding along one strand of DNA. The RNA polymerase does not go back and forth like the DNA polymerase. It only moves in a forward section, reading one piece of your DNA. The minute it starts moving forward and complementary nucleotides, we are in our initial and into our elongation phase. So initiation has ended and then elongation has begun where the RNA polymerase is moving along gliding along the template strand of DNA in a forward motion, and it is matching it with complementary RNA nucleotides, allowing for the RNA to form. So you can see it right here in blue. Once the entire sequence is completed, then what we see happening is that the terminator sequence will be reached. At that point, the RNA polymerase will fall off, the DNA will coil right back up and you now have a beautiful strand of RNA. And this will happen the same regardless if you have mRNA, rRNA, or tRNA. But mRNA will be the one that will continue on directly with a copy of the message. And as it does so, it does require some processing. So we've talked about the splicing. We're gonna get rid of the introns and keep the exons. And also what we see happening is that on the three prime end of the RNA, we will often add a poly A tail. So just like a really long strand of adenine. And we, on the five prime end, we will provide what's called a cap, which basically means the DNA is gonna be slightly folded over to protect the edges on that particular end of the molecule. Now that you have your RNA, let's go ahead and do the second part. So we did our transcription, which is DNA to RNA. Now let's do translation. Translation means that we're gonna take our mRNA and we're gonna read it in codons, sets of three, and these codons will correlate with particular amino acids. And as the amino acids are recruited over, we start seeing that a polypeptide strand will form, and that of course is the goal of translation, to walk away with a protein that the cell can utilize. I'm gonna show you the codon table in one second so that we can reference that to figure out which amino acids are required. You're also gonna notice on the codon table that we have a start codon and a stop codon. In general, I tell my students that they don't have to memorize the codon table because it's easily accessible but I do recommend that they know what the start codon is because it is universal. All cells that complete transcription and translation will always start with the same codon, and that is A, 
QG. All right, now keep in mind this is happening in the cytoplasm and it is going to involve an interplaying between the mRNA, tRNA, and rRNA, but I will show you that in just a few seconds. I want to show you the table first. So here is our codon table, and as you can see within the box, it, it gives you every single combination of three nucleotides, and it tells you what amino acid it codes for. You can read the table however you would like, um, but I like to follow the publisher's recommendation, which is that you want to go over to the left side and look for your first letter here, and then go across the table to look for your second letter. So for instance, let's say we are looking for a sequence of, hmm, let's see, G, G, C. Let's say we're looking for this codon, right? The three letters found on your mRNA that's called a codon. What amino acid does it code for? So find your first letter. Here's my G. And then I'm going to go across to find my second letter. Here's my other G. And if I curtail those together, it brings me to this box right here. And on the box, I can find my third letter. And it will tell me that glycine is the amino acid that I am looking for. You might pick up on the fact that there are multiple combinations that will bring you to the same amino acids, and part of that is to cut down on the effect that a mutation might have. So the third nucleotide is often put in what we call the wobble position, which is that it doesn't matter what code goes into the third one, it will still produce the same amino acids. And in fact, in our little box, you can see that if you want to have glycine, as long as you have two Gs, you're pretty much ready to go. Because the third letter, it can be any of the combinations, a U, a G, a C, an A, and it will bring over the same amino acids. Here is the start codon, AUG. Please make sure that you know that. And then on top, you can see that there are three different examples of stop codon. No need to memorize those because those are not universal. The start codon, however, is universal, AUG. Okay, so how do we complete translation? We know that we have our mRNA. We know that we have to read it in codons. And what we see happening now is that we're going to go ahead and utilize three steps. These are all going to be happening within the cytoplasm. And these three steps are initiation, elongation, and termination. Yes, they sound very familiar because they get the same name as transcription. But of course, the events will vary because we're trying to go from RNA to protein. All right, so for initiation, what do we need? Well, first off, for initiation, we need to find our start codon. So we need to find our AUG. Here is our strand of mRNA, and the start codon is often not directly at the front or the starting point of it. So what we see happening is that we're going to need our rRNA. And I like to think of the R as reading. It's going to be reading the mRNA. Now keep in mind the R stands for ribosomal, so it's ribosomal RNA. But the rRNA has a small subunit and it has a large subunit. And in the initiation, what we see is that the small subunit will go ahead and start interacting with the mRNA and it will look for the start codon. Once it has found the start codon, that means that we're going to ignore anything that came before that, and we're only going to concentrate on what happens after you find the start codon. And as you find the start codon, we near the end of initiation, and we see that the large ribosomal subunit will come and recruit itself and click into place with the small subunit, allowing for initiation to end and elongation to start. Elongation, just like with transcription, elongation and translation is where most of the work is done. So if we go over to our slide, what we see happening over here is that the rRNA continues to read the codons, so sections of three, and each codon stands for a particular amino acid. So we can see that our tRNA right over here will bring over the amino acid that is required. Now, a fun little thing to point out, when you look at the structure of the tRNA, you're going to notice the amino acid is on one end 
on the other hand is they're going to have an anti-codon. So here, for instance, we can see that the codon we're reading on mRNA is CUA, and that's going to allow us to produce a particular amino acid. When the tRNA brings over that amino acid, it wants to make sure it's put in the proper sequence or proper location. So the tRNA has an anticodon that is complementary to the codon. So see how it has a C? Well, then the, t, uh, the tRNA has a G. The U with the A and the U with the A right here. So this will form a temporarily match just to make sure that the tRNA is in the proper location. Once it is properly matched, it will deposit or leave off the amino acid. So you can see my chain of amino acids continue to grow. And the tRNA is released, so it can go ahead and recruit additional amino acids. This will continue to go on until a stop codon is reached. Once you reach a stop codon, then you are done. The rRNA, the large and the small units, will dissociate and fall apart. Your peptide strand will continue on to be folded into its proper shape. And then the mRNA strand can either be recycled or it will be broken down so that we can utilize those nucleotides for another synthesis. So if we're summarizing it, we see that in order for us to go from DNA to amino acids or proteins, we're first going to have to do transcription, which allows the DNA to be copied into RNA. And then translation means that we're going to take three letters of the nucleotide, aka the codons, and we will determine which amino acids are required for the formation of our polypeptide bond. Now, codon is mRNA. And then anticodon is tRNA. And that, once again, is to assure that the amino acid is placed in the proper spot. Here we have an illustrated example where we have our naked DNA. You can see how they've indicated for you the sections that are required for the genes to be expressed. And it says, here is your DNA. And your DNA, we're going to go ahead and do transcription and match it up, so T with A, A with U, C with G, G with C. We're going to go across the entire way, and we're going to start doing our transcription, generating mRNA. Once the mRNA is done, we are then going to read them in sets of three. Those are our codons. And the codons will determine which amino acids are required. And the amino acids is being brought over by tRNA, which matches the anticodon with the codon to make sure it's properly releasing the amino acid. Once the amino acid starts to be collected, we then form a polypeptide chain, and that will then give rise to the protein that we need. In our class, I would love for us to be able to demonstrate this by giving you a sequence of DNA and having you work through the process of transcription and translation. So taking that DNA and making RNA and then dividing it into the codons and utilizing the codons to collect the amino acid. In fact, you're gonna find that I've uploaded an example of how to complete transcription and translation um, as a sort of short answer type question. So feel free to peruse that video and take a look at how we can do DNA to RNA to proteins. But instead of your cell, we're going to just use a sheet of paper. All righty. Now, to finish off today, I just want to quickly mention that there will come a time where the cell has either some damaged organelles, some debris, or even the cell itself. It will become time for it to kind of um, become obsolete or damaged and to get rid of it. A lot of times what we see is that if there is a non-functioning organelle or some debris, the cells will do autophagy, which is self-eating, and it will just kind of wrap that debris or item it's trying to get rid of. Um, it will wrap a membrane around it, and it will release some lysosome enzymes inside of it to destroy it and get rid of it. Proteins that are no longer needed can be, destruct, uh, can be destroyed um, due to being tagged by uh, ubiquitins. 
Ubiquitins then means that there is a proteasome, a large complex that comes along and that removes the proteins and cuts them back up into amino acids. As for the cell as an entity, um, there are two main forms of cell death. You have what they call necrosis, which is that the cell becomes inflamed and literally pops open. That will often cause inflammation to happen in the neighboring cells as well. The other version of cell death is a lot more organized and it's called apoptosis. Apoptosis is called programmed cell death. And what happens is, is that the cell will note that there is abnormalities and it will release caspates, which will then go and cause the DNA in a very organized matter to become fragmented and destroyed. And we see that the DNA as well as the cell will literally implode. So the cell will start shrinking and shrinking in a very organized format. No inflammation is induced. And eventually the cell is small enough that a white blood cell like a macrophage will come around and literally phagocytose or bulk eat it, thereby getting rid of the obsolete or damaged cell. Wow, that's the end of chapter three. A lot of different topics. And as I said at the beginning, it was almost like a little bio class in our A&P course. <laughs> so feel free to peruse through the materials. And as always, I am an email away for any of your questions, comments, or concerns. Have fun and please enjoy the rest of your day. Bye for now.